it's Heather again and we are back in the goat barn with a little bit of an issue. A lot of you might remember our goat, Elpis, who was born on the farm here in early March and the skin issues that she's been having for quite some time. So five weeks ago, Elpis actually presented with a really small, about quarter-sized raw spot on her shoulder. And overnight, it just expanded into this huge, giant, really scary open wound. Now, a lot of illnesses that goats can have can look very, very similar. They can't talk and tell us exactly what is wrong. So I went through the whole gambit trying to figure out what was wrong with her. We thought it was mites. We thought maybe she had a mineral imbalance. We thought maybe she had come into contact with something that was irritating her skin. So we treated her with antibiotics topical poron dewormers and anti-parasite medications. And actually her hair started growing back, so I thought we were over the hump. Well, not very long after her hair started growing back on her neck and head, did she lose control of her back legs. And we've never had anything like that happen here. There's quite a few reasons why a goat may lose control of their back legs. And one of the main reasons is a selenium deficiency. And that's really the first thing that I thought was wrong with her because when Elpis was born, she was a weaker kid. You could get her to stand, but you had to kind of prop her up and she was pretty unsteady for quite a while. At the time, I had attributed that to her having uh, her umbilical cord broke pretty early in her birth process and she did bleed more than normal. But when this started happening, I thought, hey, maybe she really is selenium deficient. So I started giving her selenium. Our vet actually gave us a BOC injectable. So I gave her that. I was given permission to give her that two times by the vet and when two injections of BOCI didn't do anything, I promptly brought her in. Hello. Hi. Do we got our goat friends here? Uh, yeah, and I brought like a paper of everything that she's had in the last little bit, because it's been a lot. Okay. I've been trying to figure it out at home, but yeah. I'm, I'm lost officially. All right, <laughs> so what seems to be going on with her? She started out with this skin infection or rash or itchy spot in it spread up into her head and on her waddle that's on the other side. It looks miles better and the hair is starting to grow back, but as soon as that started to heal, now she like, she can't tell right now because she's leaning right here, but she doesn't walk well and she can't really stand. She can't okay. really turn, she falls over. Okay. She's really weak on her legs. She kind of acts like, in my opinion, that she can't see. All right, about how long has this been going on? Three days, I okay. only did it on Sunday. This part, the other part, the skin started five weeks ago. Well, it turns out after the vet only had her back for a few minutes that the vet said she had a classic case of meningeal worm or brain worm. There's other terms for this worm. A lot of people call it deer worm because that's where it comes from. The deer are the main host for this worm and they actually don't reproduce well in goats at all. And that's part of the reason this worm can cause so many issues when they do happen to get into a goat and they got into Elpis. So the way that this worm operates, it actually gets into the meninges or the very thin outer coating of the nervous system in the white-tailed deer. They lay their eggs. The eggs somehow migrate out into the digestive system and get pooped out by the deer and then re-ingested, brought into the first stomach and then essentially coughed up as larvae into the grass. And at that point, the larvae hope to be crossed over by some slugs or a snail, and they use that slug or snail as a vector species to further the development of the larvae until they're hopefully taken up again by another deer and the life cycle continues. It crawls through the stomach wall at that point up into the spinal cord or the meninges. They don't actually cross into the spinal cord in deer, but they can get really super lost when they get into the body of a goat and just wreak havoc on the nervous system. The way that this particular worm presents in goats is really variable. It honestly depends on where along the nervous system or the whole spinal cord, including the brain, this worm happens to lose control. Sometimes goats don't have any symptoms other than death because what I'm assuming happens is the worm makes its way into a part of the brain that controls something like breathing or heartbeat and does damage there. And you can imagine that death could be very swift at that point, essentially with no warning. 
Thankfully, I guess you could look at it that way, in Elpis's case, what the worm did initially was exit through the nerve endings along her spinal cord and kind of weasel its way through her skin. Literally, this is so disgusting. And it caused very intense itching for her. So intense that she tore open raw spots in her skin. So we did everything we could with her skin issue that we did not know was the worm at the time. But it's like the worm backtracked to where it came from, went right back into her spinal cord, where it really started to wreak havoc and cause major issues for her. Atta girl, good job. This is actually our third day of treatment and what the doctor prescribed for Elpis is a very, very high dose of Panacur dewormer. And she also suggested that I give Elpis this high level vitamin B complex. It has thiamine in it and that's very important because thiamine is very essential to the goat's rumen function. And if your thiamine is low, if the goats really aren't eating well, it's basically a snowball effect and a downhill issue from there. So I've got thiamine in here. I give it subcutaneously. Good girl. I have read that vitamin B is more quickly absorbed through the oral route. I have this injectable form. The oral form is pretty expensive and the vet took no issue with me giving it to her this way. So as far as killing the actual worm is concerned, the vet prescribed half a tube of the 10 gram Panacur every day for five days. And that is for Elpis's weight. So if you're suspecting something like that in your goat, you're gonna have to take their weight and give 10 times the normal dose of the 10 gram paste to your goat for five consecutive days. In order to give this to her, it's quite a lot of medicine. I find it easier to put it in a syringe like this and get it as far back in her throat as possible and push very, very slowly. She hates this, but she needs it or she will die. Elpis was not a bottle baby goat. A lot of bottle baby goats really like to suck down medicine because they don't care what it is. It just reminds them of their babyhood. So it's a little bit harder to give her medicine than it might be for a bottle baby. Good girl. We're gonna go slow. Okay. I know you need more. You need more. Good girl, Abby. Good girl. You need a little more. I know. You're doing awesome. Girl. I think she's improving because she was having a hard time even squatting to pee at all um, and she's managing now. Again, this is day three of treatment. Good girl. The barn's pretty gross right now, but you can tell this little hole in the ground here. This is their pee spot. Ugh. Hello. I've been saying that Panacur is what I'm using, and Panacur is a name brand for this specific dewormer. It comes in other brand names, so don't think that Panacur is the only brand that you can use. It's more important that it happens to be this specific dewormer. The reason it's important that you use that specific dewormer instead of something like ivermectin is because that dewormer is the only one that is known to cross the blood-brain barrier. And that's really important when you have a worm that's literally living inside the spinal cord of the goat. A dewormer such as ivermectin can't cross that barrier and will have no impact on the worm. Calamity thinks it's the Calamity Show. It's not. It's not, and you should be grateful it's not the Calamity Show, okay? So how do we get brainworm on our farm? Well, it's pretty simple. For the last couple years, my husband has actually hunted deer in this corner of our property. And until recently, I mean the beginning part of this year, this was not part of our goat pasture. So in years past, this specific spot has been frequented very, very often by white-tailed deer. And so where deer kind of hang out a lot, where they bed down, where they graze often, where they look for minerals, they will inevitably poop a lot. Ruminants poop a whole ton. 
our livestock guardian dogs until this year couldn't get back into this spot. And when I was reading about the deer worm, the brain worm, I actually read that the larval stages can live through winter, even through sub-freezing temperatures. So it's very, very likely that the worm that Alpa got in her spinal column is actually a worm that was deposited here sometime last year. <laughs> He's being camera shy right now, but our livestock guardian dog, Mars, he readily runs deer out of this area. But I have a feeling that the deer being run off by the dog are going to be spending a lot less time here. And in theory, we should have a lot less of an issue with the deer worm in the coming years. You a good boy? Yeah. You a good boy? We have had such a bad drought situation this year that out of all years and out of all times, I would have thought that right now would have been a good time to let the goats out at the pond because where there's this much heat and this much sun and this much drought, you shouldn't be having really much of a snail problem, but obviously help us got it from somewhere. So all we can do is treat, be aware of the signs and be able to treat earlier and keep a watch out of the rest of the herd. I asked the vet if she thought that there was a big risk to the rest of my herd, and she said no. And I asked the vet if she thought there was something wrong with Elpis that made her more susceptible, because all of the goats graze the same area, and I was wondering, maybe something was wrong with her immune system, maybe she still did have a mineral imbalance, but she did blood work and thought Elpis looked perfect, and she just was unlucky. If you have experience with deer worm, brain worm, meningeal worm, all of the above, please leave that experience in the comment section below. I know that that information is going to be really valuable. Sharing different experiences with this parasite can help shed light on different things that people should look for and different ways that people can manage the problem. Deer worm and brain worm, it sounds really scary, but I don't think it's necessarily more scary than the other worms and parasites that goats deal with on a daily basis. It's not that it is impossible to treat, especially when you know the signs and can treat as early as humanly possible. The vet said that Elpis should be expected to make a really good recovery and be able to be bred and have a relatively normal life. She said that she may not be able to be perfectly stable on her legs for the remainder of her life. Like I'll probably always be able to tell that something is off with her, but she should heal almost to 100% of what she used to be. And we're so hoping for that. I can't see her past calamity. It's not the calamity show. Deer worm is not able to complete its life cycle inside the goat. So just because Elpis has deer worm doesn't mean that she is pooping out all of these different deer worm larvae and it's going to infect the rest of the herd. The same is not the case for many other worms that can affect goats. Some people who live in high whitetail traffic areas will actually treat monthly with ivermectin to try to prevent deer worm. It takes about 10 days from the ingestion of the larvae for it to be able to reach the spinal column. So in theory, in that 10 day window, it could be killed by something like ivermectin. Problem being, if you're dosing your goat that often, there's a very good chance that you're going to be developing resistance in your herd to all kinds of other worms, stomach worms, lung worms, things like that, that actually kill more goats per year than the deer worm. So it's something you want to treat as you see symptoms and don't try to treat it and get ahead of it because you really could just be creating a bigger problem. They also say that you can mow your field real short so that the vector species, the snail, doesn't really have any places to hide and that the sun beating down on the grass will kill them. Problem being, we know that keeping grass really short isn't good for all of the other types of worms like we talked about before. So you kind of have to weigh your options and decide which thing you would rather deal with. <laughs> I'm gonna leave some links in the description and in the pinned comment below if you wanna read up a little bit more on this nasty worm that we're dealing with here. I encourage you not to be scared of such things. Take precautions, what you can. Sometimes keeping deer out of your field is a lot like herding cats. It's essentially impossible. I'm gonna leave a link right up here that shows Elpis in the beginning stages of dealing with this brain worm. I didn't know what was going on at the time, but if you'd like to see that, go ahead and click it. 
Don't bite my boob. Oh gosh, I'm being eaten alive. Ah! No, that's diamonds. No, no, I know you're high maintenance, but goodness.